All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Happy Wednesday morning to you. Um, we're going to start first by talking about uh, the next assignment. And I know that your assignment 101 isn't due yet, but I like to introduce the assignment 102 before we kind of get too involved in doing these cutouts and masking and, and what have you. So we're gonna spend some time today really talking about masking and cutouts and working in Photoshop. So a lot of my lecture uh, today will be demonstration. So we'll go through, we'll talk about how do we do these things? How do we perform these operations? We'll also talk about merging images together using a clone stamp tool. Um, so we'll introduce all of those as concepts. That being said, uh, I'm gonna take the first 10 to 15 minutes and talk about the upcoming assignment, the one that's coming. So you have the best photograph, that one's gonna be due next Monday. It'll be due on uh, at midnight on that Monday. So if you have problems or you have questions or something you want me to go over, um, we can discuss it on the check-in next Monday. Um, the, the following assignment will be due one week later. Uh, and this one is where we start to combine images together. So I'm gonna share my screen here and then I will show you. Give me a second to get organized here. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to show you assignment 102. So assignment 102 is due the following Monday. So this is September 26th by midnight. And what you're going to be working on is you're going to be up combining two images together that wouldn't otherwise be, on, be belong together. So you're going to bend or break reality. You'll do something that couldn't happen in reality, but you'll make it look like it is happening. Um, maybe you'll combine objects of different scales. Uh, maybe you'll remove objects so that things are floating. And I'll show you a bunch of examples. I'll show you today both professional examples and student examples. And so those should help get your brain kind of started on it. There is also a, 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 a bunch of old assignments that are on my website. You can look at the showcase there and see a bunch of ideas uh, that may spark what you're interested in doing. Uh, key thing here is that you need to use your own photographs for this assignment. So they can be older photographs. They can be ones you've taken from before. However, they have to be yours. So I don't want you scouring the internet to find uh, these objects. I want you to actually take your own images. And part of that is because you can carefully control the lighting conditions when you take the, pic the images. And that's really, there's a lot about combining images has to do with how the lighting combines. And they'll be more or less successful depending on how the lighting is set up. Uh, like I said, you're gonna be uh, turning in your work to Canvas on Monday by midnight. This is 926. Uh, you will also have your peer reviews automatically assigned on that day at midnight. So if you turn it in, you'll get your peer reviews assigned and you can go ahead and, and follow up with those. I'll remind you about the peer reviews. We haven't even done the first set yet. Um, but with that being said, let's go ahead and look at some examples. Um, and this is really to get your brain thinking. And you, after today, you'll start to have skills when it comes to masking. Uh, certainly after uh, 108 and 109 next week, you'll have a pretty good abilities to complete this assignment. So let's move forward. This is what I'm talking about. So we're bending reality. We're making things that wouldn't otherwise happen or be reality become reality. And this is what we can do in Photoshop. We can take what is normal and we can kind of bend it and play with it a little bit more. This is probably the most simple example. And if you're struggling to come up with an idea or you're struggling with Photoshop, this is what I would take as my cue. And that is simply that we've taken two images to set this up. And again, we, I have no, no knowledge of who the photographer was. I'm using this as an example. But essentially, the first image would be the person here with its normal reflection in the mirror. And again, you want to take these at the same place. So you're setting up your, your phone on a tripod. You're setting it up against the counter or whatever. So you're taking the same picture twice. So you have one and his reflection would be in the mirror. Then you swap out this first person. So this person here goes away and you take the older person and you put him right here. Then you take another picture, same camera angle, same everything. And when we go to create this, let me get rid of some of my lines here. When we go to create this, we're simply going to cut out right here in Photoshop and create a mask so that in the first image, which is on top, this image, 
we're cutting out where that mirror would be and we're substituting in the second image right here. So it's a simple swap and we'll use a mask to do that. And I'll introduce the concept of masks a bunch today. Sometimes they end up being more on the creepy side. This one to me is just oddly bizarre. But you can certainly push those kinds of boundaries. Now this one is interesting, but I think it would be more successful if it had some kind of a backdrop to it. I think the, the fake white backdrop with the blatantly fake shadow uh, kills a lot of this particular model for me. I really, really like this one. Again, it would be nice if there was more of a, uh, a backdrop on it, but this is a simple combination of a photograph of feet and a photograph of shoes. And what they've done is they very carefully paid attention to the wrinkles that naturally occur in the shoes. And they've lined that up with the wrinkles of the toes. And that's part of how these blend together so nicely is that the wrinkles match up with the knuckles. Now, obviously the, the, the leather tone has to be similar to the, the toes in tone to get them to combine together. We can do some post-processing if necessary. But you can see that those are really a matter of blending those two together, again, using a mask. Another example here where they're cutting out the model and planting the plant. This one's hard to do because of the way that the lighting works. And you're kind of getting this, this oddly bright light right in the center of the leaf. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot to this one to get it to line up correctly. But again, it's a combination. It's a masking of images. And I'll show you some student examples as we go forward. Part of the reason that this one is successful is because the background image this here is blurry. So we've got the foreground image being nice and sharp, but the background image is blurry. So we can't really tell what's in here other than the puzzle piece is missing. And that's a really good technique. Right? Sometimes it's combination or layers. You've got the drawing accessing the being from outside the frame of the image, going into the image, cutting the scar on the tree, which also cuts through the finger. You know, it's kind of a, a layering effect. There's a sometimes it's about seeing things that you know shouldn't be there. I think this would be a little bit more successful if the composition was better, so that the eye here was over at about a third, so it was right about there. There's our one third line. It's one third up, but uh, you know, there's always little improvements. So sometimes it's about seeing it. You've seen these displays at the um, grocery store with all the carrots or whatever. Could you substitute the eyeball in for one of the carrots? Just kind of a bizarre way of looking at the world. This one with the arms reaching out of the toilet. Hard to get the, the shadows and the arms just right. I think they did a, a really nice job doing it, especially with the hand that's gripping over the, the toilet seat. Um, and so you'd need to be able to fake that and before you stitch it together. So you need some kind of a white object to grab onto when you take that particular photograph. This one's the close-up of the eye being blended in with the kind of clay parched dirt. And I think part of the reason this one is as successful as it is, is because just the eye, so just this shape right here, is left in color. So that's the only piece that's in color. Everything else is in black and white. And it helps with the blending, because this is in black and white, the blending from the skin to the uh, parched earth works a little bit easier that way. Now this series, and we'll show you several of these and, and many that are kind of working in this same theme, is a combination again of two images. One image, you've got the person standing, so their legs would be right here, right, with the feet, and you take the image. Then you carefully step out of the, you know, pants, the jeans, and then you take another image such that you can replace the interior. So let me back up here back up my lines what we're replacing is we're cutting this part right here and we're replacing the original image that has the legs in it with the inside of the jeans after the legs have been removed so it's a again a combination of two images so 
Sometimes it's a shift in scale. So in this one, the cat becomes large and the lady becomes much smaller and she's standing against it. Part of the reason this one works is because of the shadow that's being cast, kind of carefully considered onto the surface, that's good. To me, the shadow should extend down a little bit more. We should see more of the shadow in here. I'm not sure why it doesn't include the whole shadow. Um, the other thing that is a little bit challenging with this is the light is coming from this direction in this scene because we see the shadow on the teacup right there. So really, this shadow should be over on this side. Or it should be cast down from, from there. So it's just little things. So it still works. It's nice that there's a shadow. It helps integrate, but it's not quite right. This one's just silly. It makes me laugh. So this is a lot like the, um, the one in the mirror, the first one that I showed you. Uh, the difference being that you've got the kitten and the paws are lining up here and the reflection uh, in the, the pond is the lion. Bending reality here with, uh, you know, super strength. Similar in concept, the, the, the dad in this case is being supported by something that's not the kid. We take the picture, we remove the dad and the something, and then you put the kid in with his hand up there to be holding the dad. So it's again, a combination of two images. This one is very cool, um, but probably not something you're gonna succeed at doing because of what's involved in the high-speed photography of it, but I still like it as an example. Kind of goofy. If you have a bunch of little like gerbil things lying around, you could attempt something like this. This one's kind of a fun shift in scale. So you've got the, the major landscape background, and then you've got the super large fish that transitions into the island. Which I think is kind of a, a unique take on it. This one's kind of fun because you've got the, the shards of arm versus the pot. So the arms broke. And I think that one's really nicely done. Sometimes it's just seeing things. So you've got these power lines that get placed into guitar strings. So you recognize the similarities and the differences in scale. This one's kind of creative where you're ironing your own clothes and the clothes are flat, but then they come back. I think part of the reason that this is as successful as it is is down here at the bottom, the feet are still whole. So the person gets flat while they're ironing themselves and then the feet end up at the bottom, which is kind of fun. This is a shift in perspective. So we're looking down and the ceiling, uh, the floor becomes the ceiling which is kind of an interesting set of perspectives that are being pushed together. The melting hand holding the ice cream bar. Another example here where the sheets become the winter snowscape. Kind of fun. The, the cloudy weather turning into the sunny weather with these little paper rolls. This took a lot of effort to put in, but I think it worked really, really nicely. Painting in the ocean. I think this is a nice use of selective color. Everything's in black and white, except for the color that she's painting. This one's pretty fun where they're paving the road where you've got the road and then you've got the, somebody pulling a tarp um, and you transition the tarp into the road to combine those two images together. Another shift in perspective. Change in seasons. So this is not something you'll be able to do because you won't be able to photograph two different seasons from the exact same spot unless you already had these images. But it's kind of a creative combination of the two. There's just something silly about this one that I like.
All right, so let's look at some student examples. I told you I'd show some student examples as well. So everything from here forward are all examples that people have done in this class. So this one, uh, it's kind of like when you see an object in the clouds, seeing an object in the rocks. Um, he was able to combine his dog's mouth into the, the rock sculpture here. When Arash did this, he doesn't have all of these tattoos, but he added the tattoos to himself, put in the background, and added the zipper uh, on his lips. Kind of an interesting take. This one's just plain creepy. I think it would be a little bit stronger if the background wasn't quite so stark. I think this one is probably one of the best done. Got a great composition. We're following rule of thirds nicely. And the subtlety with which the nose and the cat mouth come together is just really, really nice. I think the eyes are particularly well done as well. I think it's also highly successful because the eyes are the only part that's in color. And it really helps this image to stand out. So I use this one because it's kind of a silly example. Like it doesn't really do much. Um, it does follow the rule of thirds for composition, but it's not a particularly exciting photograph. But the reason that it works so well, the reason that this dog's head can go on the pig so easily is because they're both shot the same way. They were shot at night with a flash, head on. And so the picture of the pigs, same thing, picture of the dog. And then it's a matter of combining the two, taking the pig's head off, adding the dog's head on. This one ended up being a little bit more of an artistic. He used a little bit more of the filters to kind of set this up. Combination of a dancer and a flower. So the dress becomes the flower. And so that, that key transition is happening right in here where the dress turns into the flower. I think she did a particularly nice job of aligning these kind of ribs on the petal with the ribs on the dress. I think that's part of what, what sells this as a combination. This was the, the kind of the same strategy as that one I showed you earlier, where you've got the hand that's the drawing, doing the drawing on the person. Again, I think this is successful because the color is used selectively or really highlighting the drawing and the tattoo that are being added. I love this one. Uh, it's a combination of two images. You've got one image, the first image with the person standing against the wall. And obviously the person's head would be there. Uh, then they took the shirt off, hung it on a hanger, and hung it on the wall in the exact same place. And they were able to essentially swap out the image, this part of the image, where the head would be. Whoops. Where the, stop. Where the head would be right there. They were able to swap that out for the part with the hanger. Uh, but Cam, when she did this one, she went out. This was at the ET buildings back when we had class in person. And she sat on one of the drafting stools, and it was right here. Then she took the draft and took the picture. Then she took the drafting stool and herself away and took a picture from the same place of the whole background. And what that allowed her to do is to mask off all of this where the stool was. But she was also very careful and got rid of the shadow that's behind. So there's no shadow of the stool on the wall here either. So she's able to get rid of the shadow here and the stool. And that's how she became a floating object. John did this one a while back, kind of in the same vein as the ironing board example, uh, where the pants transition. So you take one picture with you laying on the bed with the pants on, you take another picture with the pants in the same place, and then you transition the pants with nothing into the person. This one's actually pretty simple. It's two pictures, one with the hand in front and the other with the hand down. And you're just using the masking tool to allow the eyes, nose, and mouth to come through. This was transitioning um, the, the cello into a person. I think it would be a little bit more successful if there was some strings down the back, right in there. The people showing up in the steam, if you look carefully right there, hard one to do, 
you have to use some drawing skills in there to, to actually create the, the drawing of the person. This one is one of those, can you see it? It's really subtle, but very nicely done. If you look carefully right here, there's a face in the bark. So this probably had a lot of clone stamping that was done to it to get those, those high quality results. The profile and the straight on shot. That pencil drawing versus the photograph and kind of the transition of the two. Neat combination to me. Another setup of, of images. This was back when The Walking Dead was really popular. Somebody set this one up. And this is a shift in scale where you have the little glass object with the tree inside of it. So those are all ideas to get you kind of started, to get you thinking about what you might want to do. Chew on those. Remember, try to be consistent about your lighting. Set your camera up somewhere where it's in the same place when you take the images. That'll lead to success when you start to combine images together. All right, so now on to kind of the nitty gritty part of today. And that is, we need to learn how to cut out objects. So we're gonna move on, let me get my mouse going here. Let's close this down. All right, and we're going to work today. I'm gonna to go into our exercises. What is it, 107, there we go. And again, remember that this is designed to take you two hours. So if you don't make it through part one and part two, if you don't make all five of them and all three of them, that's perfectly okay. You work for two hours and you turn in what you've completed. So we're gonna start with part one and that is isolating images. And what we'll do today is we're gonna cut out people because I think it's a good you know, task to learn how to cut out people and we'll be able to use them a little bit later on. The second part is about tiling textures or repeating patterns. And really that's designed to teach you how to use the clone stamp tool in Photoshop. So we're, we're tackling two different things today part one and part two. Ideally, you're gonna have five images of people that are isolated and three images of tiling textures. That being said, remember, if you've worked for two hours, keep a timer, you turn in what you have. I don't want you to keep working for hours and hours and hours on this. So let's start working with some demonstrations. I have the uh, lab computer open here. The first thing I need to do is I actually need to find some images to cut out. Now I asked you when you did assignment 103 to take pictures of people. And you may find that you can use the people that you took pictures of. You may also find that you want to do a Google search for new people, that's fine. If you do, do a Creative Commons search. So I'm gonna do search.creativecommons.org. And I'm going to look for images and let's say a uh, person walking. And so I'm looking for a high quality image. And let's see if we can image size, let's pick large. There you go. And what I'm looking for is I don't want a person like this where the head's cut off, the bottom's cut off. I need a whole person. I'm also not particularly interested in a person that's far away like this. So I want a person maybe like this, that's very close to the scene. Now for me, this is probably not the best image to do the cutout because of all the trees in the background. It's gonna make cutting him out much, much harder than it would otherwise be. So let's keep looking. And I, I usually pick these images live because it shows you that it takes time to find the right image. Again, I wouldn't pick those. All right, so let's try another one. I said person walking, let's uh, try and running. Okay, this one would probably be fairly easy to set up. It's a little bit low in perspective, but I'll go ahead and open that in a new tab and save it. And let's keep looking here. Uh, 
I'm getting fairly terrible results. There you go, there's another one. Let's try it. woman. Oops, oops. All right, that one could be good. Ah, there's two. So what I do when I'm looking is a lot of times I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and open a bunch as I'm kind of looking through and then I can play around with them, right? So something like this is gonna be fairly easy to cut out. This one is gonna be reasonable. I'm gonna use this one as my example. I'm gonna click on get this image. Let me go to free download. Uh, okay. And this is the other problem. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I want to let me download it. Flickr usually does a better job at letting me download this, but of course it's not. Let's see if I got another option here. Go back to this one, Let's see. Ah, all of these are terrible. Uh, let me try a Flickr search. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, Unsplash is another good place to find them. So let's try this one. Ah, okay. What I'm looking for some specifics. See this with the hair? I'm trying to pick one that's a little bit more challenging so that you guys can see me do this. So let me go ahead and uh, download this one. Let's go the original size. There it is, much better. I'd say use Unsplash. That worked a little bit better. It's unsplash.com. Let me show in my folder here. And there it is. I'm gonna go ahead and right click on it. And I'm going to say, uh, open with Photoshop. So let me go to open with and Photoshop. I'm not worried about copying the original image onto my flash drive because we're gonna be just working with this image. So a couple other key things while this is opening, I'm looking for the person to take up the bulk of what it is that I'm trying to cut out. And I'm also looking for um, a large image size. So here, original size of 5,000 pixels by almost 4,000 pixels, that's a great image to work from. So there it is. So what I want to be able to do is I wanna be able to cut her out completely. So I get rid of the background, the background becomes transparent. There's a lot of background here that I just don't care about. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll come over here in Photoshop and I'll choose the crop tool, which is right here. Looks like two overlapping rectangles. I'll choose the crop tool and I'm going to move the overall image size so that it's just around the person. So I need to make sure I include her shoe here. And I include that shoe and I include all of her hair. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And then I will commit to it by pressing this check mark on the, the contextual ribbon at the top of the page. There it is. And by doing that, I got rid of the superfluous parts of the image because I just don't need those. I'm gonna press control zero or command zero on the Mac to make it fill the screen. And then I'm gonna work on cutting her out. And I'll do that using this magnetic lasso tool. So I'm gonna click on the magnetic lasso, it's hidden underneath. So if I look down, it's the third tool down, it's probably showing by default the lasso tool. I'm gonna to come down to the magnetic lasso tool. And with the magnetic lasso tool, I'm gonna kind of draw right along the edge. And you see, as I start to do that, it does a pretty good job of finding where that transition is, where that edge is. So I'll work my way around. And in some places it doesn't do the best job, but in other places it does an awfully good job.
There we go. Do we need to click or it's automatically? So I'm just clicking and holding as I'm dragging. And I'm sorry that it takes me a little bit of time to get all the way around here. I would love it to be faster, but I do have to spend a little bit of time working on it. And we work our way around here. There we go. And almost there. Now the head is always hard, as is this hair. What? Someone's microphone is on and they're eating. Yep. As soon as I can let go, I will mute them. <laughs> but I can't let go until I'm done with my selection. All right, almost there. All right, so I've made my selection all the way around. Oops. Oh no. All right, let me try that again. It should have should have ended. I should have double clicked at the end. That was my mistake. Let me mute that. There we go. Okay. Let me try this one more time. I'm sorry. Even I make mistakes. Uh, it turns out you don't have to hold the mouse button down. So I'm doing a little bit quicker this time won't be as accurate. I would take your time because it'll involve less fixes at the end. For my demonstration purposes, the part I care about is up at the head. That's what we're going to spend time doing. All right. Up there. It's amazing how much better Photoshop is at doing this than it used to be. All right, so when I get back there, I'm gonna double click. And it's gonna make a selection. And so there are some mistakes in the selection. So we can see like right here on the legs, that's a mistake, that's a mistake, et cetera. But what I can do is I can use this select and mask tool. So right here in the contextual ribbon, at the end of that, there is a select and mask button. And when I create that select and mask button, it's going to show me in kind of this preview mode. It's gonna give me properties over here and it's gonna show me in a preview mode what's been cut out. And right now I kind of have this onion skin background. There are other view modes here. Overlay sometimes is really useful because you can see what's been cut out and what hasn't been cut out. So you can see that I have some issues like there. I can use the control plus and control minus to zoom in and zoom out. I should be able to. Oh, sorry, I have to pick overlay. Control plus to zoom in. I can also hold down spacebar to pan. Okay, and so I have some different tools here. So I have my quick selection tool. Below that, I have my refine edge brush tool. I have a regular brush tool. And then I have some object selection tools, et cetera. So let's use this um, quick selection tool. And you'll see, let me press uh, the bracket key to make my mouse a little bit bitter. You'll see that I have a plus sign. The plus is adding to my selection. So if I move my mouse over that little bit of red there, you'll see that it's adding that to my selection. Likewise, if I move my mouse um, actually over here, see, see how that area, I just lost it. If I hold down the control key, the alt key, excuse me. If I hold down the alt key on a Mac, it's the option key. Uh, I can actually kind of fill back in that region. Likewise, I could fill back in that region. Oh, I went too far. Let's add this back. Right, so I can work on it. Now, right now, come over here. Yeah, my settings are okay. We can, this in this constance, we're, we're working in color aware mode. We can also go into object aware mode. Um, so it, it'll switch whether it's looking at objects or whether it's looking at colors, uh, just different strategies. So we can go there um, and let's come back in here and we're gonna add those fingers back in. I can make my cursor really small and I can fill in 
oops, sorry, I have to hold down the option key or the alt key and I can kind of fill in that little bit right in there. Uh, did you change it, the size? So to change the size, I can do it up here under the size slider right here, or I can press the bracket keys on the keyboard. So there's my bracket key to make it bigger. There's my bracket key to make it smaller, or I can come up here in the size and change my size right there with the slider. Okay, so I'm gonna switch back into my um, alt mode where I have the little minus in the middle and I'm gonna fill in that section a little bit. Then I might have to kind of work my way back like that, et cetera. Now, once we have this relatively close, we can use something called the refine edge tool, which is right here to help us identify like the individual hairs and stuff. And we'll do that. And there's some settings for this edge detection that will help us. We're gonna do a radius of, we'll keep the radius at zero. We're gonna smoothing of three and a feather of 0.3 like that. And then we'll come in here with that refine edge tool. And I'm gonna make this a little bit larger here. And we're going to paint over that little bit of hair. And you'll see that it'll start to cut out that hair for us. There we go. And so we should be getting a little bit more of the cutout around the hair. So let's work on that. On the back side there. Work in there. If you're struggling to see it in the red, you can also switch into a black and white version. And there you can start to see the hair really appearing. So you see, if I move, if I zoom in, let me do control plus here. Well, it doesn't wanna let me do it. Um, you can see that it's really starting to, to find those little bits of hair and highlights. That's one of the hardest parts to cut out is always the hair. And so we wanna work our way through. Sometimes the black on white is harder to see than the overlay mode. This refine edge will also work just right along the edge too of a particular object. So if we wanted to kind of fine tune an edge, we can just paint over that edge. We wanted to fine tune the fingertips here, we could fine tune those fingertips. If I wanted to get in between those, now well, that didn't work the best, let's paint over this. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Looks like that didn't work as well for those fingers. It would probably work well for that. There we go. Now I could zoom in and switch back to that original brush here and get rid of some of those little pieces. Come on. Like that. And again, we can switch back into my black and white and we can start to see what's happening. So the fingers still need some, some, some help. Yeah, it's, they're, they're having trouble. Switch back to the minus here. Let's see if we can do it. Yeah, it's not, not playing nice. I'm gonna switch back to the color aware. And let me switch back to the overlay mode. We need to get that finger back. Let me click on the plus here, to add, and we'll paint that finger back in. Let me use my minus brush to kind of fine tune that just a little bit. And we'll fine tune that just a little bit. And then we'll switch back over into the plus. So we're just playing backwards and forwards with this as we improve it. There we go. And theoretically, when I switch back to the black and white, yeah, those fingers are getting much, much better. So we can use especially the refined edge in the hair, but we can use it on other edges too. So we can use that bottom in the shoe here. Let me go back to my overlay mode. Let me go back to that refine edge. We can use that kind of on the bottom of the shoe. And hopefully that'll improve it just a little bit. Eh, it looks like it's not. Yeah, it's a little better. I think I might go back to my original selections here and let's paint that out instead. 
Let me make my brush a little bit larger. That I went too far, so let's go back to the subtract. And right like that. So I would spend a little bit more time. I need to fix some things like the back side of this leg. Back side of that leg. Back side of that leg. Unfortunately, I lost a few during that selection. So I may have to paint it back in. So this is the kind of thing where it does take time to work your way through these options to get good results. Okay, so let's say that I like it the way that I am. When I'm done with this refined edge, I'll go ahead and say, okay. Now, when I say, okay, nothing actually happens other than I get a selection. So I come back and I end up with just the selection again. In order to actually cut out the object, I need to use the selection on the background layer. Currently, the background layer is locked. That's how it is by default. In order to unlock it, I'm going to right click on the layer. And I'm going to say layer from background. Then that'll change it from being the background layer to layer zero. Layer zero is now an active layer, and I can actually work with it. So I have my selection. We're leaving that selection active. And on layer zero, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to choose this add layer mask. Now it's possible that I have to invert the selection, but let's go ahead and try the add layer mask and see what happens. Nope, I did it correctly. And you see that when I do that, the background becomes transparent. We see this checkerboard pattern. And we now have this person as completely cut out. Now, similar to what happened with our... Um, panoramas when we stitched images together we now have the image and then we have what's called a mask and this mask is applying to the image so the parts on this mask that we can see here that are white are still showing the objects the parts that are black are causing them to go away so the cool thing about this is if we have a mistake by using this mask we can come in and we can paint on this mask layer and fix it so here i have this little mistake here that shouldn't be there. Well, as long as I'm clicked on the mask, I can use my paintbrush tool with, I need black as my foreground color. There it is with black. And anything that I paint with black will become transparent. So I can actually fix this after the fact. I could make my brush a little bit bigger and I could come in here and I could fix it. Now, if my hand jiggles and I make a mistake, I can switch the color that I'm painting to white. Again, this is on the mask layer, and I can get that back. Now, I also have the option. You can see right now that the edge that I'm creating is a little bit blurry. If I want that edge to be sharp, I can come up to my brush, and I could choose uh, the hardness to be 100%, and that'll create a nice sharp edge rather than that blurry edge, right like that. I'm going to flip my colors so that I'm painting in black again, and I'll clean that part out. Maybe I'll clean a little bit on the back side here. Like that. So I can really fine tune this after I make my selection. The places that are harder to fine tune, you know, these are all solid objects. The places that are harder to fine tune are things like the hair. So there's one strand of hair that I know what that was that was kind of flying out here. Um, if I went back and painted that in white, we could see there's that strand of hair. But getting that strand of hair back is going to be much more challenging now that I don't have the refined edge tool. So let me paint in white this time. Oops, sorry, in black. And then let me change my hardness down. It just makes a softer edge. And I can try to work on painting that one strand of hair back. Like that. Looks like I'm missing a little bit right in there. So let me flip this 
and we'll correct that little bit of hair right there. Right like that. So it's just a little bit of fine tuning there. Okay, so let me press control zero to see the whole image. There it is. This is the person that I've cut out. I'm happy with, with how it turned out. Now I need to go ahead and save this person. So to do that, we need to preserve the transparency. We went through all this work to get the transparency. Now would be a good time to preserve it. So I'm gonna go up to file, export, and then export as. And instead of choosing a JPEG, like we did last time, I'm gonna make sure that I choose a PNG file. This PNG file is critical because it preserves transparency. See that checkbox? That means the transparency is gonna be preserved. I'm gonna leave it at full resolution and I'll go ahead and click on export. So let me put this on my flash drive. And I'm gonna call it woman running zero one underscore color. And I'll go ahead and click on save. And that'll then save her in color. I'm going to create two more pieces of this file that we can use later on. The first one is just the black and white of the same thing. Sometimes you don't want the color to stand out. It's easy to, to drop this into black and white. It's also some practice. I'm going to go up to my layer, new adjustment layer. If I can find it, there it is. And I'm going to go to channel mixer. This is black and white. And you guys have done this before. We're going to, in the channel mixer properties, I'm going to check the box for monochrome. And I'll quickly flip through my presets to decide which one looks best. Yeah, I think that one's pretty good. And then I'll go ahead and save this in black and white. I'll go to File, Export, Export As. Again, I'm going to choose a PNG. I'll click on export. This is now going to be underscore BW for black and white. Perfect. So there's the next piece. Now this next and, and kind of final piece is something that we will use next class when we start to, to build these out. We're going to use this as a silhouette or ultimately as a shadow to add realism when we combine images together. So what I need is I need the same person, the same outline to be in gray rather than in color. So what I'll do is I'll create a new layer. It's just a new basic layer. So let me go to my layer, new layer. And we'll go ahead and say, okay. And there it is. So if I were to turn everything else off, we'd see just the plain layer. I want to fill this layer with a neutral 50% or excuse me, neutral 75% gray. I can do that using the brush tool. So I can click on the brush tool and then I need to change my color. So I'll double click on black here from being black to being 75% gray. Easiest way to do that is to look at the CMYK values. K is black. I'm gonna change CMY to all be zero and K to be 75. And that is a neutral 75% gray. I've found that this is a pretty good color to use because it can easily get darkened or lightened after the fact. So it's a good one to save. And it's neutral. It's not warm. It's not cool. So it doesn't have any orange in it. It doesn't have any blue in it. Just kind of a flat gray. And we'll go ahead and say, okay. And then I need to paint this all in. And so I'll do that. Let's make the brush size much bigger. So I'm just hitting the bracket key until my brush gets really big. And then I'm going to paint this in. And I'm just painting the whole piece, right, like that. So it's all gray. Now that that's all gray, what I want is I want to take this mask that I created down here and copy it up onto this layer. And I'll do that by holding down the Alt key on the keyboard. On a Mac, it's the Option key. I'll hold that down, and I will drag the mask up. And when I do that, it's going to actually create a copy of the mask. So see, the mask was here. I've created a copy of the mask here, and now we see a silhouette of the person running. I can now save this silhouette 
as an image as well. So I'll go to File, Export, and then Export As. There it is. All the, the options are the same. I'm making sure it's a PNG and I'm preserving the transparency. And this is going to be gray. You could add underscore shadow. You could add underscore gray. You could add underscore silhouette, but I can never spell silhouette, so I don't use that. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and click on save. So depending on time, you're going to try to do five of these cutouts. Again, I'm not going to do another one because I don't have the time to go through it with you because I want to move on and talk about the next piece. So what I would do as you're working through this is I would, uh, do I have it? Oh, it's pulled up on my Mac. Hold on one second. Pull back. What happened to it? There it is. I would do one isolation. So I'd pick an image and I'd isolate it just like I did. Then I'd move on and do one tiling texture. After I'm done with the tiling texture, I go back and do the next isolated image. And we'll see how far you get in those two hours. So let's talk about tiling textures. So tiling textures are patterns that can repeat or textures that can repeat over and over again. You can do a Google search for tiling texture. So let's see concrete tiling texture. And theoretically, these seamless textures or these tiling textures, what they allow you to do is you could take it and you could copy it and use it over and over again. So this edge of this texture would match up with this edge of this texture. And the nice thing is that this has gotten to the point where there's a lot of these that exist online. So you can just find them. But we want to talk about how would you create them. So in order to do that, I need to start with some base image. So I'm going to start with Unsplash again. And I'm going to look for an image of like, let's say, wood siding. And when I'm looking for wood siding, I don't want some kind of dilapidated wood siding. I want some wood siding that I could actually use and, and repeat here. So something like this might be OK. Something like this might be OK. Let me keep looking and seeing. I do like this one a lot, right? So this is fairly consistent. We get some wood grain. Yeah, this would work. <coughs> Let me go ahead and download it. Actually, I should download in the high resolution here. <coughs> Sorry, I'm suffering a bit from a cold, so I'm working my way through it. All right, so I've downloaded that. Let's open it up in Photoshop. So I'm going to show it in its folder. I'm going to right click on it and say open with Photoshop. And there it is. And so when we when we look at a tiling texture, we're looking at being able to repeat it. And this one actually is fairly close to being repeatable. I'm going to show you a demonstration. This is not something you're doing as part of it, but I want to kind of illustrate the point of a tiling texture. So I'm going to adjust the uh, canvas size here. I'm just giving myself a lot more work, space to work with. Oh, darn it. I needed to do a layer from background first. Let me unlock that background layer. There it is. Now, let me do, uh, I'm going to change the canvas size. All right, so now if I were to take this original image and copy it and then paste it, what I mean by a tiling texture is that this and this would line up and I couldn't tell that these were two different images. Likewise, if these two went side by side like that, I couldn't tell that they were two images. If I put this one here, I couldn't tell that they were two images. Now we can see as we look at these, that they're separate images. They're close and they line up, but there's color differences. So there's a color difference there. There's a color difference at the top and the bottom. So when I go back and do this, I'm going to use a smaller section of this image to try to make a tiling texture. 
So let me go back to where I just had the single image. There it is. Let me press Control-0 so that I can see the whole image. And I'm going to work with just a piece of the top of this image because the color changes by the time we get to the bottom. So first off, I'm going to use the Crop tool to kind of shrink this down. And we do that maybe. And I'm going to shrink this down to come up here. Now, what I want to think about is that if this edge were to match up with something, it would match up about, let's say, a third of the way up on a piece of siding, maybe there. Maybe it's a little bit further down. It's on this piece of siding. It would be right about there. So let's say I did that. I'm going to commit to that crop. And now we have a much smaller piece of this image. The other thing that matters is whether these lines are in fact straight across. They're pretty straight across in this image. So I could view my rulers. So I'm going to view and then rulers. And I could drag a guide down just to kind of check. Yeah, they're pretty straight across. If they weren't straight across, there is a way of tweaking those just a bit. But they're straight across enough for I'm not going to worry about it. OK, now I'm going to use a filter. I'm going to go up to Filter. I'm going to go to Other. And I'm going to Offset. So it's Filter, Other, and then Offset. And what this offset does is it basically cuts the image into four parts. And it rearranges the image. So if, let's use this horizontal one first. As I start to drag it, let me go back a little bit. It's taken the original image. So let me go to zero for a second. It's taken this image, and it's going to cut it right in the center. And then it's going to reassemble it so that the outer edge matches up with the other outer edge. So we'll shift this over just a little bit further. I'm looking for this to be right about in the middle. There it is. So this used to be my outer right edge. And this used to be my outer left edge. But now they're in the middle. This matches up perfectly with what's happening over here. So those are now seamless. It's the middle that's not. I can do the same thing vertically. I can just drag this slider up. And as I start to drag that up, we'll see a place. I'm looking for it to be about in the middle, right there, where I have a horizontal line here as well. So now I need to transition all of these pieces. I need to make them work together. And that's where this thing called the clone stamp is going to come in. I'm going to say, OK. And again, this is fundamentally about learning the clone stamp tool. So if I look over here on the left side, there's an icon that looks like a rubber stamp. That's what we're going to be working with. It's called the clone stamp tool. And what the clone stamp tool does is it copies from one area and pastes to another area. So let me make my brush a little bit larger so you can see this like that. And what I can do is I can copy from a particular place. So let's say I like this place right here. If I hold down the Alt key and then click, it's going to copy that piece somewhere else. So you can see it showing up. No matter where I move it, it's copying the piece that's right here over here or down here or over here. So my job is to make these parts kind of line up and seam together. See how that is now making the, the transition? a lot smoother. So we'll continue and we'll copy. Nope. Oh, now I'm starting to get close to the edge here. So I may have to recopy. Let's go down and hold the Alt key again. I'm going to copy right on that line. And we'll move over to right about there. And we'll transition across that line like that. I'll hold down Alt again. Copy from here. I'm going to work my way down. I start to get there. I need to copy this line. I'm going to be right on that line. And we'll come over here and line it up. And we'll make that copy. So this now is starting to feel much more seamless. I still have a little bit of ghosting right in there because of the color change. I'm going to hold down the Alt key. And we're going to extend this out just a little bit. Oops, didn't like that. Hold down this. We'll copy that right in there like that. So let's come down to this part. I'll hold down Alt to copy from. Alt to copy from. 
Now, remember, we have a vertical transition to happen here too. So we may even find that we need to copy from up here, kind of across that middle, like that, to get it to kind of blend together a little bit better. And then maybe we'll take this piece and copy across there. And so you can see these are starting to go together. Now, I don't always have to pick the, the left side and transition to the right side. I could pick the right side and start to transition to the left side if I wanted to, like that. Right? Let's come down here. Let's do this piece. Transition that bridge across. A little bit more here. a little bit across the top right there. And that's then looking pretty good as its combination. There's still a few color issues. I may need to, to fine tune it. But now that I've finished this, if we go back, I'm going to go ahead and save it before I do this. Let me go to file and then export and export as. Again, we're going to choose a PNG, full resolution here. I'll click on export. And this is siding. Tiling texture, and I'll click Save. But I, what I want to show you after it's done with its export is that this then will start to tile. So let me go back and I'll show this as an illustration. Let me go to my canvas size. And you don't have to do this part. It's just me. Oops. All right, let me. I'm going to copy this just so you can see it. Control C and then Control V. At this point, if I seam these two together, you won't be able to tell that that's a seam. Likewise, if I seam these two together, you won't be able to tell that's a seam. And before you know it, you can keep this going over and over. Oops. Now, now that I'm actually tiling it, I can see that I made a few errors that are really obvious, like this spot appears over and over and over again. So those are just little things that um, I should have paid a little more attention to when I created it. I'd spend a little bit more time blending it, uh, but you get the idea of what we're trying to do. Again, this isn't about creating the perfect tiling texture. What it ultimately is about is learning to use the clone stamp tool. We'll repeat the clone stamp tool. We'll use it again next class, but I like to introduce it as a concept early on. Okay, so I know I'm just about out of time, but those are the two kind of primary things we're working with today, cutting out somebody and then doing the tiling texture. Like I said, I would start, let me pull up my thing here. I would start doing an isolated image. Once you've gotten done with the isolated image, come back and do a tiling texture. Once you're done with the tiling texture, go back and do another isolated image until you've used up your two hour allotment of time, okay? So if you didn't check in with me on Monday, I'm going to stop my share there. If you didn't check in with me on Monday, I need you to make sure you show up at a check-in today uh, so that you can get your credit for this week. It's relatively simple what we'll go through. We're just going to talk about problems and, and issues in Photoshop. Um, I'll give you the opportunity to share your assignment 101 if you want to go over that. If you came on Monday, and find that you want to come back because you have another question, remember you're more than welcome to attend another session, but I need at least one per week. All right. So with that, I'll let you go. Um, I'll keep the, the chat open. We will uh, reconvene at, I think, 910. It gives us a little bit of a break for some caffeine, and then we'll, we'll start back up again. All right. I'll see you guys next week if I don't see you in my check-in this week.